Good day to my Music 110 Introduction to Music class. I uh, thought I'd try a little different setting, so I came out on the back of the house and thought I would give a lecture on the porch, so to speak. Uh, this lecture will cover the next period is the Baroque period. Now, the Baroque period roughly covers 1600 to 1750 or so. Uh, we're coming out of the Renaissance period, and just to sort of catch us up, I want to talk for a second about what's known as the pendulum effect of history. We began studying Western civilization, Western music, of, uh, music of Western civilization, that is, with the medieval age. And that went roughly from 400 AD to around 1450 or so. Uh, and it was a time where the church had primary control over things, a very... Uh, stiff period you might say static period uh, the church wouldn't a lot of, let a lot of innovation and new things happen it happened slowly but you had a thousand years there of where things moved very slowly we hit the ars nova for a brief period and it sort of opened the door to what is known as the renaissance and in the renaissance everything swung back to the other side that pendulum which had been far to the right now goes back to the left and things open up there's more variety allowed, more, more of everything allowed. There's more people creating music, more people creating art, uh, businesses, printing presses created. You have a lot of innovations. It is just a total new time. Some people have said that the Renaissance period, which was around 1450 to, to 1600, was one of man's greatest ages for artistic innovation, and, and I tend to agree with that. Um, the problem was that the church sort of raised their head again in a war, the Protestant Reformation. Uh, remember, it stopped the Renaissance because suddenly we had the Roman Catholic Church battling against Protestant churches. Anybody who protested the church was a Protestant. And in the end of that, you had the Ottoman Empire attacking Vienna, coming all the way to Vienna. And they had to stop fighting and turn and face the threat coming from the east. Meanwhile... In Spain, you had uh, the North African Muslims coming up into Spain. Uh, some of their endeavors reached all the way up in the middle of France, but they were fought back. But around the 13th century, they established a foothold, and you had the Muslim influence in Spain, which remained for quite a while. But meanwhile, while the Catholics and Protestants are fighting, they had to turn their attention to the Islamic wars, what they called the Saracens. Uh, and so you had all that going on politically and, and war-wise, but it did allow some freedom and new freedom. Now, the pendulum is going to swing back again as the church. Anytime you have a war, by the way, you have people turning back to God, asking for victory, saving, and it's no different. You had a lot of wars going on, and so everybody turns to God, Protestant and Catholic both. Uh, the odd thing was you had Protestants praying to help them defeat the Catholics, Catholics praying to help them defeat the Protestants, and then everybody praying to help them defeat the Muslims or the Saracens. But with this focus back to God for help, the church regained some of its power, but it's never going to get back to where it was, say, in the Middle Ages. But what happens is the church now begins to recognize that if they want to control, they've got to ease certain things because the people have had a taste of freedom artistic expression things like that and so what they do is they they do relax things somewhat uh, they incorporate the arts into the church and you see this period where you have michelangelo and uh, da vinci in the last period doing artistic work for the church now they encourage this you had brunelleschi creating a sense of perspective so that they, things felt more realistic, and the church incorporates that. You had musicians. Jocelyn Dupre was one in the Renaissance who gave us the motet. Well, now they incorporate more music, and the mass is still a very popular form. So the church adapts to the age, and with this comes some of the most, I don't want to say sophisticated, but that, I do want to say that word. It, it's going to get even better. But it takes on a new level of sophistication, and it's the Baroque period. Now, what is the Baroque period? Uh, I've got my laptop open. I hope you have your computer open to the PowerPoint to follow this, and you'll see 
in the first slide a definition of the word Baroque. The word comes from, its, or we think the word comes from an Italian word, uh, Barocco, which means basically bizarre. I, I don't like the bizarre part because that always makes you think it's something really odd. I think exuberant is a better word because Baroque is a time of life and excitement and a lot of ornamentation reflected in music. Now, the term itself was used uh, to describe what we call a highly decorated style. And in music, decoration means you're going to have a lot of trills, a lot of runs, uh, and things like that to make things look really good or sound really good. The other thing, in the next slide, you'll see a picture of a pearl, but it's not very symmetric. Uh, in Portuguese, there is a word called baroque, which is a term for an irregular shaped pearl. And if you look at that picture in your slide uh, presentation, you'll see that it's it's not perfectly round, but because of that, it has some, in, some indented areas and some odd areas what catches the light. And you get real beautiful reflection and bending of light. You get rainbow effects in this. And so even though it's bizarre shape, it's rather beautiful. And that sort of describes the Baroque really well. It was a time of bizarre experimentation in music and in art, but it turned out to be rather beautiful. And that's what we're going to see a lot of. Uh, the new age of thinking, and what I'm talking about here is during the Baroque is we have a scientific revolution, or maybe what well, well, I've got a rebellion. You, you notice I've got Galileo Galilei. Uh, he comes up with the idea of a heliocentric universe, which was blasphemy at first, but the church had to recognize the truth of it, uh, that the earth revolves around the sun, not the sun revolving around the earth. The other thing, remember the the other big thing was when people said the earth was flat. Uh, and I, I grew up being taught that people thought the earth was flat. It wasn't until later I found out that people didn't think the earth was flat. More people today think the earth is flat because of the flat earthers than did then because it was the church trying to say the Bible is literal. And if it says the wind came from the four corners, only things that are flat have four corners, so that's where they got that idea. Uh, but the truth is, every sailor knew the earth was curved and round. Columbus knew this, too. Uh, the other sailors, Magellan, and all those guys we talked about in the Renaissance, they knew they were dealing with an orb here. They just didn't quite understand how big it was. Uh, but here's Galileo and Copernicus, and these guys say, well, you know, there's stars in the heaven, there's heavenly bodies, and we're just one of them. The big one is the sun, and everything seems to be going around it. It took a while to get that in their mind. Uh, I was trying to remember. It seemed like I read something about where Galileo was forced to recant this, uh, even though he knew he was right, but it was like either recant this or you die, and so he, he opted for life. Uh, but he knew he was right, and eventually people changed. Uh, I also mentioned Johannes Kepler there. He created a telescope. And he sort of gave the proof that Galileo was looking for. I mean, with the telescope, you could see these objects, and you realize these objects are moving. Uh, we're not moving. We're moving in a different... We are moving, but we're moving differently. Than they are. They're moving. The only stationary thing seems to be the sun. So, then we got Sir Isaac Newton. Now, you guys have probably heard of him a lot, and the three laws of thermodynamics and that sort of thing. Uh, Newton supposedly discovered gravity, which I think that's a bit of a stretch. He didn't really discover it. He just sort of explained it. And we have the famous story of the apple hitting him on the head. But with gravity, he gives us a, a good working theory of understanding how these planets work and how they move using the force of gravity for planets. So he begins to explain. But he also does something I think probably the most important thing was Newton gave us scientific reasoning. And that was both a blessing and a curse for the church because now you have people saying, well, uh, we've got to think through this a little bit because there's some contradictory things in the church we don't quite agree with. Uh, and so we came up with the scientific method. For those of you not familiar with the scientific method, in a nutshell, I will sum it up. It's basically, if you're going to prove something, you do an experiment and if you can repeat that experiment with the same results, you have proven that to be fact. If you cannot, then you've proven it is not a fact, or at least it can't be accepted as fact. 
Now, that's pretty true, and it's pretty basic. The problem was the church was then asked to prove God. And I know you, as a Christian, you may get upset when you hear this, but it's just the fact we can't prove God. And I've always struggled with this. I've taught religion classes, and in the religion classes, I try to tell my students, I said, this is not a science class. This is a religion class. When you apply science to religion, you get a mess. Uh, you can apply religion to science, and it fits pretty well. But when you start coming into religion and saying, well, we've got to prove that Jesus existed, that God existed, that the world was created in seven days, we've got to prove all that. And so I would tell my students, I said, no, you don't. Uh, we don't have to, as Christians, we don't have to prove anything because we don't base our religion on proven fact. We base it upon faith, and there's a big difference there. The church didn't quite grasp that, and they struggled, uh, and it led to some pretty terrible things where they were trying to kill the people that were forcing people to think too much, uh, and that was a terrible thing. And, it, and people look back and say, oh, the church was so evil. God, we got rid of that. Uh, it will lead to an age of enlightenment where people will sort of put the church on the back burner. They don't give up on God, though. It, it was like before when people in the Renaissance, they did things that were against the church. The church didn't like it, but they didn't give up on God. They still worshiped God. They still believed in God. Uh, the later theists, people talk about, oh, Washington and Jefferson, they're all theists. Well, to be a theist doesn't mean you don't believe in God. It means you do believe in God. Uh, they just didn't quite explain it because they couldn't fit God into a test tube with a scientific method. But they believed. They prayed to God. Uh, I get so upset when I hear people, these atheists, say, oh, well, God doesn't exist, and Jefferson knew that, Washington knew that. They didn't know that. They believed in God. They, we've got books of their prayers. Um, the deist, I think I said theist, but the deist is, is the word I was looking for. Uh, did believe in God, but it's a little complicated, which we're not going into because this, this is music class, not religion class. But Newton was the one that sort of started us down that path with his idea of science and reason. Uh, and like I said, three laws of thermo thermodynamics, they work. Uh, then we come to an example of art. Uh, I always like to put this in because I want to connect science, I mean, pardon me, music with everything else, the culture, the other sciences, the other arts, uh, because in the arts, you see a reflection of society. I've said this a lot. Music and the arts reflect what's going on in the world. Now, this picture you're looking at in your slide presentation is entitled Judas Slaying Holofernes. This is, uh, this is a work of art that was based on a Bible story. And the Bible story is that I think it was the Syrian king sent the general Holofernes to take the city. And so the people were trying to figure out how to get rid of this army. And Judith dresses up very pretty, and she takes her servant, and she goes to seduce the general. And, of course, he falls for it. And in the midst of the seduction, they get him drunk. And as you see in this picture, uh, they cut his head off. Those are the worst kind of blind dates, by the way. But anyway... Uh, what I point out in this picture is not the fact that it's a murder, but if you were to cover the bottom part of the picture and you cover the, the gruesome act that's going on of beheading this man, you see two women in beautiful blue and burgundy dresses. There's a little darkness, but the light and the dark play on. It's a beautiful picture if you don't look at what they're doing. If you look at them just reaching down, you could say, well, they're just washing dishes. It's a really lovely picture. And then you look at the whole thing and you say, full of blood and mayhem. And there we have an idea of the bizarre attitude of the Baroque artists. They choose subject matter, which we might think is gruesome, and somehow they turn it into a beautiful painting. Uh, yet we have to deal with the fact that, okay, they did a heroic patriotic deed, but it was so bloody. This is the spirit of the Baroque. Now, next picture is architecture. And I show you the picture of a church the back of the church. And what I want you to notice, this is the, where the organ was. But notice the intricate detail and the ornamentation in the architecture. It's, it's beautiful. And the Baroque gave us some of the most beautiful buildings that's ever been created. They are lavish and in some ways outlandish in their decoration. Like I said, this is the back of the church. This is what you'd see if you were leaving. 
Uh, next, what there's a picture of a, a personal home. This is someone's palace. And this was, I think, the music room. And I've forgotten the name of the palace. I apologize. But just look at it for a second. The rose marble columns on the wall, the depth of it. Uh, if you've ever been to Biltmore House, you get a sort of a sense of this period. Biltmore uh, is sort of built with one foot in the Baroque idea, but it was built to be more of a summer home. Uh, if you can imagine a two million square foot summer home by the, I believe, wasn't it the Vanderbilts, I think, built it. But it's lavish. It's beautiful. And that's what they were going for in the Baroque, ornamented. Here is the inside of a church. The next slide, and you see the beautiful ceiling. They were into painting ceilings, decorations, lavish gold uh, leaf over everything. And I think, yeah, the next slide shows you just how important they wanted to make the church look. Now, the, the church was all for this because the church wanted to get in on all this beauty. And so they were welcoming the donations and the gifts. And what you see in this one picture, and those who don't have the slide presentation that are watching, I apologize. But the students, you have the slide presentation. Um, I experienced something like this in Mexico City one time. On Easter Sunday, I was in Mexico City, and I walked into the cathedral and went around the nave, and I came into the altar. And their altar looked very similar to this. And it was shocking because outside I saw abject poverty, people starving. Uh, a lady tried to give me her child to take back to America. And then I walked in, and I see enough gold to feed the whole city for years. But the church says, well, this is for God. And the people were quite happy. They said, well, this shows, this reflects our love of God. But all I could see was poverty on one side, on the outside, opulence on the inside. But this was the Baroque. And like I said, things are rather bizarre. Uh, the next slide, I'm talking about Baroque influence. And so I, what I did, I wanted to show you a music room in one of the German palaces. Because what I want you to notice in this slide is there certain things that uh, we're told about what's going on without seeing it, such as look at the chairs. These chairs have been tooled. They're exactly alike, which tell you that they're using some type of machinery, probably a, a hand-driven lathe. Uh, the fabric that they're em embroidered with, the flooring uses an inlaid pattern, uh, you know, the, or the inlaid wood. Then you have the walls, which are just massively beautifully decorated with paintings. Oftentimes they would paint on the wall and then they build the frame around it. Uh, architecture, like I said, or it says here, was exorbitant. And that is a sign of the Baroque. Uh, this next slide is one that I, I put in here because I think it will help you understand a little better what we're talking about. What you're looking at is a library and it's incredible incredibly beautiful. It too reminds me of the library at Biltmore House, which is much smaller, lower scale, but a similar idea of beauty, ornamentation in the library, lots of books. And then right below it, you see an old shack. And what I want you to do is to recognize the mixture of rationality and spiritualism versus materialism and sensuality, because these are the four things that are going on during this period, and they're mixed together. Rationality and spiritualism that usually affects the people living in the shack. Materialism and sensuality, that seems to be affecting the people living in the palaces. So I want you to think, what is rationality? Simply put, I define it as being a rational person is someone who tries to meet their needs. They're focused on meeting their needs. A materialistic person is someone who's focused on meeting their desires. And there's a difference. Uh, I learned this by going to the grocery store one time. And I went to the grocery store, and my wife said, get some of this, this, and this, and this. Well, when it came to getting beans, I like beans, uh, I found that you had name brands that were like two, for, this is an old story, but it was like two for a dollar. I thought, oh, two for a dollar. As I was picking up, I noticed that there was nondescript labeled cans on the bottom shelf, and they were like four for a dollar. And I thought, whoa, I can get four cans of beans for what I get, two cans of beans. So I loaded up the buggy with all these nondescript labels. It was the store brand. And I went back and my wife saw it. She said, what is that? I said, it's a deal. You know, she, she checked the dates. I never check dates, but she said, check the dates. They're going out. Well, I did check the dates and some of them were a little old. And I thought, well, yeah, what would happen? You get a little tummy ache. Uh, she said, take them back, get the good stuff. 
that struck me as odd because I grew up uh, more in poverty. And so if I could save money to get something, that seemed more logical. I was a rational person. Meet your needs because you can't afford to meet your desires. Uh, but that's what these people did. They didn't. They couldn't go uh, buy the finest clothes and wear them. They, they had one set of clothes they wore all year round. They had one set of shoes that they tried to keep together. Uh, enough of my sad stories. But along with rationality, what they had to lean on was they turned to God for help. Spiritualism. They would go and pray for help. The guy living in the castle, he would go to church basically to be seen in church and to donate to the church so that God would intervene and, and bless him through the priest, and, or the priest. But quite often... Those who had everything they needed and could meet all their desires didn't really need God. They were their own God. Uh, sensuality was more in their liking than material than what you'd say spirituality. Now, sensualism, I'm not talking sexually. I'm talking about sensual being in that they, they please their senses. Uh, if you want to sleep on a nice bed, you want cotton sheets that have a gazillion thread count uh, whereas the peasants probably sleeping on a bed of straw with a horse blanket over them but the wealthy they want to live wealthy uh, you see this today uh, people who have money invest that money in living well uh, I was watching TV last night and, and my daughter called me and she said what are you watching I said I'm thinking about buying this house in Florida she said really I said yeah it's only 35 million dollars it's got like 10 bedrooms and we had a good laugh because Basically, I could come up with the uh, 39 cents if she had the $35 million. But this is what the Baroque was all about. You had a clear classes of people. It wasn't the feudal system, but it was very similar. Because, like I said, the pendulum has swung back to medieval ideologies. So now you have the rich nobility, the poor peasants, and the church right in between, keeping them. Uh, now... That gives you an idea of the culture we're dealing with. Let's focus on the music. So go to the next slide, and you'll see Baroque characteristics. Now, church music was, again, very prominent. Most people couldn't afford to go to theaters, but the theaters were popping up. But still, for the poor, church was where you heard music. Uh, it was still carried the influence of Renaissance music. There was a, a heavy secular influence in general music. And the church influence was they were still doing motets. Uh, which was like a magical, but sacred. In the Baroque, you see, I basically put three periods. Uh, Monteverdi, that guy we mentioned in the last PowerPoint, had given us an opera, and so the rich liked the opera. The poor couldn't afford opera, so they created their own form of opera in bars and stuff. Uh, it was, mostly it was buffa, which means parodies. Then there was the period of instrumental music, where more and more people wanted to play an instrument. And you had organs, you had harpsichords, you had violins, and pretty soon all of those weird instruments we saw in the Renaissance evolved into more instruments like what we're used to seeing today. And you had the first orchestra, the Baroque orchestra. And it had strings and harps and things like that. And then finally, toward the end, you have what is known as the oratorio. Now we're gonna talk more about that when we talk about the composers of this period, but it is a church opera. Uh, some of the characteristics you look at in the next slide, you'll see three primary characteristics. One is what's known as the doctrine of affections. And what that is, is music, uh, it was sort of an unwritten rule, but you write music to show one certain mood. You don't change keys and go from major to minor as much as you stay in one key. If it's going to be happy, keep it happy. If it's going to be sad, put it in a minor key and keep it sad. Then you see some holdovers from the Renaissance, such as, uh, dynamics, but these dynamics are different. The Renaissance instruments didn't have the power to get really loud and really soft. What they could do is go from being soft to loud. They, those instruments didn't have the capability that the instruments have today. So they call it terrace dynamics. You were playing soft, then you're playing loud, then you're playing soft, loud, soft, loud, like that. That's called terrace dynamics, but composers were encouraged to use this uh, contrasting dynamics. And then finally, uh, the homophonic texture, which was created you know, way back there in the late Middle Ages Renaissance, now becomes the key thing. And what that is, is with 
the homophonic texture, you had voices, solo and choirs, but you had instruments accompanying them. And that becomes the characteristics of the music. Uh, there are some new forms. Remember way back in the Middle Ages when they had the estampe, which was a dance? And then you had the opera, and then you had the motet, and you had the madrigal, you had the mass. Well, the new form of this one that's most popular for instrumentalists is called the fugue. And a fugue is simply sort of a chase. You have a theme, and then you pick that theme up again, and you play it again, and it's sort of like they wrestle. And I'm talking, I don't know if you can hear the dogs in the background. That's not me barking. Uh, but uh, remember a fugue. There's definition there. Now... We're going to come to a couple of composers. The first one you see is Johann Sebastian Bach. Uh, after him, you will see, and I'm just skipping ahead, you'll see George Friedrich Handel. Uh, now, I mentioned a couple others, but for this period, these two men, Bach and Handel, are what you'd say are the quintessential composers of the Baroque period. And it's interesting to do a comparison of them. They're, they're like twin brothers from different mothers. I know you've heard that before. But they're very similar and at the same time very different. And I'll explain that. For Bach, some of the characteristics. I mentioned here he created the fugue, by the way. He also created a choral form called the chorale, where the people sing. Uh, he was famous for his organ playing, though. And he also created uh, some lessons teaching people how to play. There was a guy, I can't remember his name, but he said that if he if aliens came to Earth and he wanted to introduce them to the Oh, excuse me. I had a forgot to put this on do not disturb, so that was a phone call trying to come in. But Bach uh well, I'm sorry. The guy who said if aliens came to Earth and he wanted to expose them to something to explain Earth, he would play for them Bach music because it is so perfect and symmetrical, mathematical, and genius. Uh, Bach was that. He was a deeply religious man. He never ventured probably a hundred or so miles from his home. He worked in several different places. I'll show you a timeline. Uh, but you can tell the Bach manuscripts because if you find an ancient Bach manuscript, you know it's Bach because up in the left-hand corner are the letters JJ, which stands for Yezu Juva, which was a prayer. He prayed a prayer before every composition, which simply means, Jesus, help me. And then in the bottom right-hand corner of his last page of the composition, he would write SDG, which stands for Soli Deo Gloria, which means, to God be the glory. In other words, he wasn't trying to be famous. He was trying to please God. He worked in churches all his life. Uh, he started out, his mother died, his father remarried. The father died, and the girl he married didn't really want to keep him, so his older brother took him and raised him, taught him how to fix organs, how to play instruments, and got him on the path of music, thankfully for us. Um, he is the model composer. I've got a picture of his birthplace. You can look at that. And the first church he served, the Eisenach Church. And I'll show you one of his manuscripts on a slide just for you to look at. Then there's a timeline. And on this top line, uh, I don't worry, I'm not going to make you memorize it, but I'm just showing you that how his life sort of went as a child and where he worked, uh, the various places he worked. Now, this is just for information because I don't think I'm going to put this on the test. So skip ahead and you come to our next composer, uh, Mr. George Friedrich Handel. Now, Handel, if you look at Handel and you go back and look at Bach, you'll see they're similar, but they're different. Handel was different in the uh, he was more of a secular composer Bach was a religious composer but Bach wrote some secular stuff Handel wrote some religious stuff so you can't just say they're totally in one group they they did whatever uh Bach was trying to please God Handel was trying to please the audience he was more of an entrepreneur type guy um I usually tell people I said notice the clothing if you go back and look at Bach he's wearing a pretty plain jacket and a short wig it's just to his shoulders you look at Handel he's got a beautiful jacket and notice how long his wig is I don't know if you've ever heard this term but used to people who are wealthy we call them big wigs and the reason why they were big wigs is because during the Baroque people wore wigs and the bigger your wig that reflected your wealth so Handel here is wearing a rather big wig uh, and so that's where we got that term 
Now, in the next slide, you'll see Handel as a younger man dressed to the nines, looking great. But then you see Handel on the right, and he looks a lot like Bach. He's dressed like Bach. He's got a small wig. Because at one point in his life, he was an opera composer, and opera lost favor, and he lost a lot of money. Uh, and he almost lost his eyesight because he was trying to write all the time. Uh, fortunately, he did pull out of that, and he got wealthy again, so just let you know that but he ran the gamut. Bach was never about money. He was always asking for a raise because they didn't pay him enough hardly to survive, and he took in students. At one point, he had 21 people living in his house. Uh, he had a lot of kids, but he also had students that came and lived with him so he could make ends meet. Uh, Handel made ends meet by going and performing everywhere. He performed for all the crown heads. He was especially popular in England. Uh, when he went to England, he performed there, and they liked him so much that they gave him an honorary degree and honorary citizenship, and they offered to pay him to stay in England, uh, but he was German, and so he would, he realized, hey, I can make money overseas too, so he went back to Germany, but he spent a lot of time in Italy, because Italy was the, where opera was going on. Handel is noted for his operas, uh, he was the master of the Italian opera form, which was the acceptable opera form. So opera was big for Handel. When opera began to sort of, I guess you'd say, wane, um, he decided that the church music was there and they were paying for it. So he began to write operas for churches. And he was in, supposedly, this is the story, he was in Rome. And in Rome, you have, you know, St. Peter's, but you also have a place called the Oratory where lay people would meet and they would sing and they would talk and discuss the Bible. He was in the Oratory and he heard some songs. He said, these are great songs. Turns out they were songs from the Renaissance called La Laude Spiritualis. And he liked the tune. So he, st he stole them. There was no copyright. And he put them into stories that the people, because they were familiar with the songs. So he put them into new stories and he wrote about Bible characters. And he said, well, since this is music from the oratory, I will call this an oratorio. Because in Italy, that's where they were performed, was in the oratory. So the oratorio is born, and it's everything from, like, the conversion of Paul, the story of Jephthah, the story of Samson, the story of uh, Elijah. The, and in his biggest, he wrote in Ireland, by the way, uh, he decided rather than just write a character, he was going to do the character. He was going to write the story of Jesus. And so he wrote the oratorio, the Messiah, which became legendary. It is still legendary today. Uh, he wrote 39 operas, as you'll see on that slide, but he's best known for uh, the opera, or pardon me, the oratorio, the Messiah, somebody else calling. Um, and in the Messiah, there's a chorus. It's actually in the middle, not at the end, but it sounds like a finale called the Hallelujah Chorus. Uh, and I'll probably post that on so you can listen to it. Uh, the next slide, you'll see the Handel timeline, and you'll notice about Handel, he traveled a lot. Uh, it wasn't until later in life, that the, around 1737, that opera collapsed, and it almost killed him. He was bankrupt, paralyzed, but his last opera didn't do that well. But he's, he fell back on the oratorio thing, and he did all right. Um after this, and I know I'm moving sort of quickly, but you can go through this and see this. Uh, I show you a composer. This is uh, Vivaldi and Scarlatti, a couple of names to be familiar with because a lot of their music has survived. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Vivaldi and a little bit about Scarlatti in the next two slides. And then we come to some characteristics of opera, which I did want to point out because it gives us a whole new uh, vocabulary. What is an opera? It is a drama sung with orchestra. And it has sets, costumes, everything, uh, as opposed to an oratorio, which doesn't have costumes and sets. It's, it's just the music and the dialogue. Uh, the text of an opera is called libretto, which literally means the little book. And a solo song in an opera is called an aria. And all the great opera singers want to have their own aria. So they would pay the composers to and say, write me an aria and slip it in there. Uh, they had sections where they wanted to get dialogue out, so rather than sing it as a, a melodic thing, they sang it as a spoken thing. So it was half sung, half spoken. They called that, I see, you see the word on your slide, it looks like recitative, it's pronounced recitative. So a recitative is someone who will half speak through it. 
Uh, and that became very popular because it was sort of like a place for improvisation for the artist. Uh, but the composers wrote it. Now, the term overture is there, and that, that became the pre predecessor to what would be the classical symphony. Because an overture is where you take all the music and you play little snippets of it to tease the audience. Before the whole thing starts, they listen to the symphonic overture. And then when they hear it, and then they'll see the opera, and they'll hear that, they'll think, oh, yeah, I remember that. Uh, this will evolve into the symphony in the next period. And then finally, the people, the skilled performers, the words you already know. If you were a skilled instrumentalist, often you were called a virtuoso. If you were a skilled singer, you were called a diva. Today we have divas. Uh, and so we have people like Aretha Franklin, Mariah Carey, Whitney Houston, Celine Dion, Shania Twain. Uh, we call those all divas. And there's other, but I'm dating myself with the ones I can remember. Now, the, the final slide here is Baroque terms to remember. Uh, there's several terms here, and then you have a compare and contrast question. This is what your test is going to look like. Uh, I think, I, I may not have made the test yet. I've got part of it made. But I'm going to try to do basically a matching for the terms. And then I'll ask you to compare and contrast a few of the things, such as compare and contrast the opera and the oratorio. Well, I sort of just told you, an opera was a play with sets and costumes, and oratorio was the same music, just no sets, no costumes. The compare and contrast Bach and Handel, same music, just one was secular, one was sacred, even though they each wrote secular and sacred. Uh, Handel was more secular, Bach was more sacred. And then what is meant by rationale and spiritualism versus materialism? And we went through that already, so you go back and listen to this. Um, now, that gets us through the Baroque period. So I'm going to post this lecture, and I'm going to post PowerPoint. I will have some music samples I'd like you to listen to, because we've come to a period... Oh, the bird. We've come to a period where music is sort of growing up. Uh, we're on the verge of a major breakout of music. Baroque period has got some of the most incredible music that's ever been written, and it sets the stage for the coming classical period. And in that classical period, we will reach a high water point. So that's the only tease I'm going to give you. But look over this and get ready, and, and then you'll see your test. I'm going to put it on a separate document in Blackboard. So any questions, you can text me or call me. I may answer, I may not, because I'm getting a lot of spam calls. Uh, but I think you'll find this interesting and go back through this PowerPoint and look at it again. But I thank you for listening. I see other people who join and listen. I thank you for listening too. But that's it for today.